fill those out and just put them in the offering plate, and then Mike can keep things straight, and or we'll keep emails up to date. Thank you. 
I was looking for Cameron this morning. I was going to give another woo, but uh, I'll, I'll get her trained. Nothing I can do with the rest of you. So. Start, start young. Any joys this morning? I'm a brave one on it. You look like she's playing old man ball of the night, and I started <laughs> 435 against Tigers Valley, and she does look good sportsmanship. I agree with that one. I agree with that. I, I don't want to know if it, well, I'm not going to say it, then that way I don't get in trouble. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I'm gonna behave. <laughs> what about concerns today? Um, I'm gonna run down and, and then you all can add. Of course, everything's going on in Ukraine and, and around the world. Uh, Uh, had surgery, returned home yesterday. Uh, Jim Warner uh, needs our <coughs> prayers. Uh, Roger Ashley is still recovering from uh, broken ribs. Uh, Joe Mathias, I was told this morning, he is um, starting to become more and more conscious. Uh, so, uh, Marie Pitsenbarger, Neva Rex Road. Uh, Doris Short is recovering from shingles. Uh, of course, I need to keep that eye. I'd ask you to pray for my mom. Uh, Ruth, Ruth Park, uh, Cindy DeFalco, uh, Steve and Greg Smith. And I got this email this morning from uh, uh, Debbie and Barry Glover. said of Jessica Cart and the son Matthew. Uh, her, her husband passed away. Uh, her, her husband, A R I N. How do you pronounce that? Yeah. Yeah. It might be. It might be. You could be pushing it. But God knows all about it. And uh, anyone else? And there are some this morning that uh, choose not to put their name on and, and unspoken, but God knows all about that as well. Right. Sister-in-law, Chuck Eccles, has been living in Odessa, and she's still there. Okay. <clears throat> all right, let's pray. Gracious. for allowing us to be here and to, to worship and to be able to rest from our labors, um, even if it's just for a few moments, because we know that we can carry our burdens to you and, and lay them down at your feet. And you've heard uh, some of those burdens this morning, and uh, we just ask that you'd touch them in the only way that you can. Be with their families, their caretakers. Uh, for what's going on in Ukraine and around the world and all of our leaders. It can be troubling times, but we trust that if we put our faith in you, that you will see us through. So Lord, help us to be your church. Help us to be your people. Show us the things today that we need to know. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. And amen. Amen. <clears throat> one, one thing I need you to change on your announcement, okay? And
and we'll send out an email on this, but Ash Wednesday service, I'm moving it up to six, okay? Ash Wednesday service, six o'clock, Walnut Street, charge line. Don't know where Walnut Street is, head that direction, okay? Six, six o'clock. If I have it at seven, I can't make it at the ball game at seven, okay? <laughs> Make that connect correction, okay? Exodus chapter 34, verse... Ninety-nine percent of you can name the specific point that I wanted you to take away from the sermon last week. If ninety-nine percent of you can relay that to me, I'll tell you a joke. <laughs> if 99% of you cannot, I'm not going to tell you a joke. What was the one point from last week that I wanted you to take away? Didn't want to hear a joke anyhow. <laughs> one thing. Build relationship and invite someone to church. Kind of. <laughs> that wasn't my one point. But... Let's, let's hear the joke. <laughs> no, no, you're not getting the joke. Treat everyone as you would like to be treated. Love others, right? In, 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 order, in order for us to live out our call, we have to learn. We have to learn to love others. And we did learn last week that, that that includes loving our enemies. No joke. Exodus, if you would, let's stand as we read God's word, if you're willing. If not, you can stay seated. Tablets of testimony in his hand. As he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone. Wait a minute. And they were afraid, right? But Moses came to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the people of Israel what he was commanding, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of God today for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Okay, here's our point, okay? You might want to keep this in mind for a future reference. Our story, our story, of living out our call, and, and again, I want to remind you of Jeremiah and, and David that uh, they, they truly felt called and known in the womb. Isaiah, whenever Isaiah comes to God, Isaiah flat out admits, he said, I am, I am a man of unclean lips, but still upon hearing whom shall I send, Isaiah is willing to say, here I am, Lord, send me. So we discover, discover, discover our call and, and how that call lived, or how we live out that call in loving others. Lo loving God, loving others, and even loving others. Of 
part of inviting others is about our story. It's about our story and how we share that glory. Look at Moses. Probably a little familiar with Moses' story, but let's, let's think about it just a little bit. Moses as a child is hidden, right, in, in the bulrushes. Raised, raised really by his mom, but in Pharaoh's house. And up Moses probably couldn't have asked for anything more. But one day, sees a fellow Israelite being beaten. Moses responds in a very harsh way by murdering. By murder, murdering that Egyptian. Now think about this. If, if, if that was our story or we're telling that story, Typically, the story's going to end there, correct? Moses has committed murder. If I'm God, I'm done with Moses. I'm going to get somebody else that acts a little bit. His father-in-law in, in Midian, and he's out in the wilderness one day or out and he sees this bush, and the bush is on fire, but he realizes it's not consumed. And he approaches the bush, and, and God speaks to him, and he said, Moses, Moses, take, take off your shoes, because this ground in which you stand is holy ground. It's this Moses that God uses to, to lead his people out of Israel. It's this Moses that as he's up on the mountain, in the presence of God and he comes off and his, his face is actually glowing because he's been in God's presence. Now typical people reaction, they see him and they're afraid. People are afraid. But as Moses speaks, see it's within that story that story that reveals reveals the glory of God and Moses shared that Moses shared that story time and time again with the people now I get it there's more to the story of, of course but you can read that as I continue to think about stories I, I thought about Ruth uh, to me, Ruth is a, is a story about redemption and grace. Now, I know you're familiar with the story of Ruth, but remember Naomi. Naomi's sons have died. Ruth and Orpha were now widows. Things are not going... Hears that there's food in Judah, so she's she's going to return. But she tells her daughter-in-law, said, "Hey, you you all remain here, here in Moab." Orpha does return, but Ruth Ruth says, "Hey, wherever you go, I'm going. I'm not staying. I'm I'm going to continue." And she does. And eventually, Ruth goes out in the into the fields and gleans. Meets a kinsman redeemer, Boaz. Eventually marries. Obed. Anybody? Linda, you're giving too much away. <laughs> o Obed? You're saying, who's Obed? Father of Jesse. Father of Jesse. Uh, did Jesse have some boys? Huh? Yeah. David? The story, right? You, you, you with me? The story mm -hmm. of how God works and how God reveals God's glory. Mary. Mary Joseph, right? Who, who were Mary and Joseph? 
We, 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 we know about it, but it, no, in the beginning, who, who were Mary and Joseph? Jo Mary, a young girl. Jo Joseph, uh, a carpenter. The two are engaged. Mary, for whatever reason, and I don't, I don't think either one of them would have stood out in the crowd, but Mary chosen to be the mother of Jesus. And for Joseph, Joseph had every right in the world, right, to put her away, to divorce and I think he had decided, right, to put her away privately, but, you know, being in the presence of God changes things. Jesus is born. They somewhat instruct and somewhat raise up. But Jesus, right, what, what this gospel is all about, Jesus who went to a cross and died so that we can have life and life everlasting. The glory in the You see, when you're in the presence of God, you can, you're going to blow. I, I believe that. Today is what? Transfiguration Sunday. You all knew that, okay? <laughs> Transfiguration Sunday. Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray, takes along with him Peter, James, John. They're up on the mountain. Jesus is changed in front of them, but I, I, I like Luke's account, and it's, it's in... It's in Luke chapter 9. But, but And they saw as if it were uh, uh, Elijah and Moses. They, they, here, here Moses shows up again, right? But it's interesting because it says that those that were with him were about all the way asleep, just like you are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but what happened? What happened in that story is that uh, when they finally woke up, and they and they witnessed this glory, and and as as a cloud overshadows them, just like Moses, they hear a voice. They hear they hear a voice saying, "This is my beloved son. Listen to me. Listen to me." The glory of God was revealed to them. Now for Peter, James, and John as they're coming off the mountain, they, they, this isn't the time. This isn't time for them to say anything about it. So they kind of keep these things forever how long, but we've got the story, right? We've got the story, and their story reveals God's glory. That's how God works. And when we, when we start thinking about inviting people, you weren't totally wrong with that, right? When, when, when we talk about inviting people, what, what does that look like? What, what does that look like in, in how we treat them and how we love them? You have to understand this. Get your pencils out. Just like school. I want you to write these things down. What's your story? What, what is your story? Because as you invite others, you're going to share your story. There's pencils back there. I looked this way. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your story? Because I, I want to put this in, in Wesleyan terms. And, and, and I, I know you're good Methodists. I know you know these but I'm, I want to remind you. In, in Wesleyan terms, Wes, Wesleyan would have looked somewhat of, at our story like this. From Wesley, you would have heard provenient grace. You would have heard justifying grace. And you would have heard sanctifying grace. But you already know this, right? You're a good Methodist. But let me define it. A good definition to me is simply this. Provenient grace. Picture a house. Pick, picture a house anywhere. Be two story, three story, whatever. Nice house. Picture, picture a good porch. Picture a good porch. If I ever build a house, I'm going to have porches around all four sides.
hot, I'll go to the other side. If it's too cold, I'll go to the hot side. Either way. But but picture this house. Picture picture the door. Picture what it might look like going in. And let's look at grace. Provenient grace. Provenient grace is that grace outside the house. It's, it's everywhere. You can't go anywhere to accept to escape this grace. It's there. It's there even when you're not aware of it. That's provenient grace. Hopefully, some way, somehow, that provenient grace at least gets you on the front porch, and you're there, there at the door, and and you just feel the Holy Spirit leading you, and and you decide I will. Anyone hears my voice and feel just open and we go in. You've been justified. Justification is, if, if we want to, it's a, a pretty quick response and immediate response. So we, we walk in that door and we're in the house and this is, this again, it's a pretty big house. And we're trying to figure out, well, well how, how, how do I live? How, how do I live in this house? That's sanctification. We're, we're trying to figure it out. So with that in mind, I want you to think about your story. Where are you at today in this story? And see, it, it really doesn't matter, but, but where are you at? Can, provenient grace, where, where have you seen that in your life? Because I can honestly stand here today and, and I... And I can see God's hand on my life and I wasn't a bit more aware of it than I'm standing here today. I've told you often, I didn't get in a lot of trouble, but I got in a good bit of trouble. But I look back sometimes over my life and think about the trouble that I could have got into even more. And as I look back on it, I can it, God, God was there for whatever reason and God had put up the stop sign and, and I hadn't even seen it but I stopped maybe you're here today and you haven't entered that relationship with Christ just yet well guess what you're here today and I told you this week you didn't you didn't just stumble in here you didn't just think well I'm just going to show up. The Holy Spirit led you here today for whatever reason. That's prevenient grace. For some of us, we, we've got to the porch and, and we're just not there yet, but you'll get there. But maybe we're here today and we've, we've walked through the door. We, we've been justified. when you truly walk through that door. But as great as that experience is, when we come into the house and, and what am I supposed to do? How, 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 how does this change me? How, how does this transform me? I've been on this journey for a, a good little while now. <clears throat> but I can tell, honestly tell you today, I'm still trying to figure out how to live in the house. Still trying to figure it out. And I believe until the day that Mike goes, and that's okay. That's okay. But you see, that's our story. That's our story. And when you look at it, when you look over that story, there are so many times God could have given up, but that's not who God is. God doesn't give up on me. He doesn't give up on you. 
So as we continue this thought process of our story, our story, right? Because when you're in the presence of God, when you're in the presence of God, you know why there's something about Jesus? Huh? There's no other, no other name under heaven that a person can be saved other than Jesus Christ. And when you're in that presence and when you're in that glory, as you think about the story, others are going to see. And as others see, they can be a lot like Israel, right? They, they can be afraid. But as you talk, as you enter that relationship, that's where the invitation begins. Again, everybody, every one of you, every one of you have a story. So last but not least, as you go home this week, as you figure out your story and figure out how you're going to share it, I want you to write down three people's names that don't come to church. Three people. Lent begins this week. I all know you know what Lent is. 40 days prior to Easter. Give up things. Give up chocolates, give up all those bad habits, right? But for Lent, as we push toward Easter, I want you to write down three names, three names of three people that you're in relationship with. And I want you to dedicate these next 40 days to praying, praying for them. And I want you to enter into relationship with those people. And I want you to share your story. I want you to share God's glory with them. Easter's a big day. It's a big day, right? Nothing. We, we know that. Well, guess what? We're going to treat it. We're going to treat it as a big day. Haven't set a goal yet. But we're going to set an attendance goal for Easter. Okay? Early church, 3,000 souls gave, them, gave their lives to Christ. As I read that, numbers matter in God's eyes. 35 points matters. Right? These three people. And Easter morning, we're going to invite them to church. We're going to pray for them 40 days. We're going to hope for them. We can't do it. But God can. God can reveal that glory. And from now, I don't know how many more weeks, but I'm going to show you how, how we get there. I think it's your story. Some of you may have to go home and think about it a while. That's okay. Some of you may be here today and, and, and you're outside the house, that's okay. That's okay. <clears throat> but you're getting closer to the front porch. <clears throat> maybe you're just stepping on. Maybe you're reaching out for the handle. Maybe you want to open it today and step in. In front of you. 
as we respond today, if, if you if you make that decision, check that box, drop it in the offering plate. That all, those that information is for me. I'll pray with you. If you want me to visit with you, I will. If you just want to talk, I will. I get being invited, but the older I get, I realize how intimidating this is. So dark. What's the song? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Your story, our story, revealing, revealing the glory of God as we stand, as we show. Long ago, Jesus stood upon a mountain, shining with the glory of his mystery and power. A voice from a cloud rang out, this is my son, our chosen, listen to him. Listen from See it in our own transformation from fear to love, from confusion to trust, from despair to hope. We rejoice in the glory of Christ. We delight in the 